All right, we get ready to begin. Thank you very much. Uh, we are here to present uh, our modeling and projections in detail for the Alberta's response to the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, I'm joined today by Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Dina Hinshaw, and the President and CEO of Alberta Health Services, Dr. Verna Yu, as well as Minister of Health, uh, Tyler Shandro. Before we begin, I'd like to give an update on the number of cases in Alberta. As of this afternoon, uh, 1,423 Albertans have tested positive for COVID-19. Currently, 44 are hospitalized, 16 are in intensive care, and now uh, we've had uh, 29 fatalities. Our hearts go out to all of those who have been affected, and not only the loved ones of the deceased, but those who continue to struggle in ICU. I, I personally have a very good friend who's now, uh, who is one of the first identified cases uh, and has been in ICU now for the past three weeks. And um, I, uh, Jay Chaudhry, and I just wanted to say that my prayers go out to him and his family as they approach uh, the Easter weekend. It is encouraging to note uh, that while the number of identified cases grew by 50 over the last 24 hours, the number of recovered cases increased by 72 to 519 here in Alberta. And uh, let me say that these scenarios, so, so last night I spoke to Albertans about probable and elevated scenarios. These scenarios help to inform decision-making and preparation activities, especially regarding health system needs. I'd like to thank folks from Alberta Health and Alberta Health Services involved in all of this important work. But before I get into the details, a few important uh, qualifiers. First of all, modeling is intended to show expected trends. It is not a day-to-day -day forecast of case increases. And the scenarios should not be considered concrete predictions. As the situation evolves and new data becomes available, the modeling will change. We will continue to refine the data and provide Albertans with updated information. So, here we are. Uh, as we know, uh, COVID-19 continues to spread rapidly around the globe. To date, Alberta has fared better than most, and Albertans need to know uh, what we can expect over the next six to eight weeks. Uh, how is the, uh, it expected to spread in Alberta? What action should we take? And what is our plan? Sorry. There we Alberta, uh, we continue to monitor what's happening locally across Canada and globally. This helps us to assess how COVID-19 may spread uh, and what interventions have been successful elsewhere in flattening the curve. So let me then present uh, the current situation. This shows uh, confirmed cases per 100,000 people. And uh, as you can see, and as I pointed out last night, uh, Alberta is doing very well in terms of the slope compared uh, to other jurisdictions. Um, fortunately, we're much closer to South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan uh, than we are, for example, to the European countries, Spain, Italy, France, uh, or for that matter, the United States. Uh, this uh, chart is a, sh so shows us uh, a per capita comparison, and it begins at February the 25th. So uh, we want to continue to see that relatively, uh, that actually very low slope that so far we've experienced here in Alberta. And uh, this is another way of looking at an international comparison. This is a uh, logarithmic chart, which, so it, it distorts the absolute numbers. Obviously, there's far fewer infections in, in Alberta than, uh, than in, you know, for example, uh, Japan uh, or the United States. But this, what this shows is the overall trend lines. And it, what it also shows is this is since the first hundred, uh, the hundredth case was reported. So it shows that uh, we're still fairly early into this. And that's why continued vigilance is necessary because you can see, for example, um, J Japan has had a low slope, but they continue to go up in terms of, of cases on a per capita basis. So uh, this is encouraging data that we're doing uh, better than most uh, countries, but it's nothing that we can take for granted. Now this compares Alberta's performance to other provinces. And uh, as I pointed out in last night's uh, television address, uh, we are uh, doing quite well. 
Uh, this is on a uh, per capita basis per 10,000 cases. These are confirmed cases. And it starts at March the 11th and it ends at April 6th. So this is a three month, uh, sorry, three week horizon. And you can see that we're quite close to Ontario and BC. Uh, what is really worrying here for Canada is the huge numbers and the very steep slope in the province of Quebec. Um, now, having said all of that, uh, it's important to recognize that because we are testing at a much higher frequency than other provinces, we are picking up more cases, and that is reflected in this chart. So if you actually uh, take that into account, we are doing better uh, than certainly the large provinces. This is another way of looking at uh, interprovincial comparisons. Again, this is a logarithmic scale. And once again, what it shows is that our slope is about half as high as the national slope, which is really pulled up by the very high incidence of uh, confirmed infections in the province of Quebec. Here we have uh, a numerical comparison, uh, and this is a very important table. It, it shows us uh, going from uh, left to right, confirmed cases, hospitalizations, people in ICUs, the intensive care, and the number of fatalities. And uh, what this shows, uh, we are now at uh, about 18,400 uh, confirmed infections with COVID-19 across Canada, of which uh, about 1,400 are in Alberta. But as I said in the television address last night, uh, the most important stat for us to follow is the number of COVID patients who end up being hospitalized and more particularly end up in intensive care. Because it's difficult for any health system to really have a, an accurate sense of the total number of people who have been infected. Uh, only a relatively small percentage of those who are infected will present with symptoms and even a smaller percentage will end up going through testing and, and being confirmed. So uh, the best way to measure the actual impact of a coronavirus in a jurisdiction is how many folks end up in the hospital because of it or in ICU. That also indicates the severity of the impact in a particular jurisdiction. And not all places are going to be affected equally. Now let me run you through these, these numbers. And I find for Alberta this should be uh, encouraging. First of all, while we have, uh, this is again per capita uh, as a function of 10,000 people. So our per capita number, 3.1 per 10,000, is uh, it's, it's roughly the same as Ontario. It's, it's obviously smaller than Quebec. It's roughly the same as Ontario and British Columbia. But when you drill down and look at hospitalizations with only about 90 hospitalizations in Alberta, that's 0.2 per 10,000 cases. Uh, and that compares to, uh, for example, we are one-fifth of where Quebec is at, one-half of where Ontario is at, and um, we are about uh, a third of where British Columbia is at. So we are doing better than other provinces, in, of the major provinces in terms of hospitalization. On intensive care, you see uh, similar ratios. Uh, and, and finally, um, there, there's not much in, in terms of differences with respect to fatalities at this point. And, and that is in part because a disproportionate share of Alberta's fatalities uh, have come out of one particular a continuing care facility uh, in Mackenzie Town in, in southeast Calgary. And so we, we've had a higher uh, number of, of um, uh, elderly frail people who, who were affected. And we'll get to the demographic impact of COVID uh, a little later in the presentation. But some people might ask, why is it that Alberta seems to be experiencing a much lower level of hospitalization? Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, as I said last night, uh, we started our first case uh, manifest in Alberta much, uh, quite a bit later than, than Ontario, British Columbia, and Quebec. I think the first infection was in British Columbia about three weeks before Alberta. Ontario followed. They were about two weeks ahead of us. So they're going to see more people in the healthcare system than we are in relative terms. But there are some other factors here. So for example, um, w because of our stronger testing, we also have been ahead of the curve in Canada on uh, tracing and containment. So meaning when somebody gets tested positive, we've been able to reach out, figure out who were they in contact with, get in touch with those people quickly, and then have them tested. 
tested perhaps when they are still asymptomatic, tested before they've gone into the hospital system, and, and therefore able to intervene medically before their situation really deteriorates. So that may be one reason why we seem to see less severity amongst uh, positive cases in Alberta. Uh, is the strength of, of testing, the, the strength of our uh, tracing system. But also we have the youngest population in Canada. And that matters, accounts for a lot in a disease like this, which attacks the elderly much more aggressively. And, um, and finally, our province is more spread out. Uh, obviously we have two big uh, urban metropolises, but it's still a big province. And um, so we, there's a final effect here called a viral load, which means that, that um, people who might come, in, come into contact with uh, the COVID-19 uh, multiple times, let's say they are working in a hospital or live in a very densely populated downtown urban area, chances are that if they get infected, it might be multiple times or it might be uh, with a more powerful load of virus than perhaps somebody living in the country or uh, uh, some people who are living more remotely. So for a number of reasons, uh, we are experiencing so far less severity. But again, that's something that we uh, cannot take for granted. We'll now look at cases and, and deaths uh, by age group in Alberta. And um, I think this confirms what we know, all of us know about this particular pandemic, which is that it affects the elderly most severely um, in terms of, of risk to, to, to health and, and uh, indeed mortal, mortal risk. But you'll, will, you will see that uh, the disproportionate share of the people infected are younger. They are young or middle-aged, but of course, a disproportionate number of those who have passed away, 25% of those in the 80 plus age category who have been confirmed uh, positive with COVID-19 uh, are uh, have unfortunately passed away. So this underscores a couple of things. Um, the fact that, that most people who end up with the virus who are younger, that the symptoms may not manifest, they may not know it, but they all need to play a role in limiting the spread. I know, you know, I've seen online and in some of the chatter and discussions here, people saying, well, why don't you just kind of close down the seniors' homes and quarantine seniors and let the rest of the society continue to function? Well, first of all, a couple of reasons. Uh, no age group is immune. As you can see, we have had uh, two deaths, I think one amongst a 20-something and one amongst a 30-something. So younger people can uh, be seriously affected by this. But the more the virus spreads amongst younger age groups, the more the, the higher the chances are that elderly people will become uh, infected and that can be very serious. So um, again, uh, it also underscores why we do need to put in place special measures that focus on our elderly population. And that is reflected, for example, in doc Dr. Hinshaw's um, uh, latest uh, prioritization of access to testing which now includes making that available to uh, people generally who are over 65 uh, who are symptomatic. Um, and so uh, it also underscores why we have continued to uh, tighten our rules around uh, continuing care facilities that are particularly vulnerable. This is uh, a comparison of testing across jurisdictions and um, th this is, has really been a phenomenal Alberta success. You can see uh, Alberta way out here ahead of other Canadian jurisdictions, other highly developed and sophisticated countries. Um, and as I heard somebody say the other day that Australia was ahead of us, well apparently not. So we're at about 1,500 tests per 100,000 people. And this has just been uh, really the uh, foundational element of Alberta's relative success in containing the virus and will be a key part, as I said last mm -hmm. night, of our relaunch strategy. Alberta's integrated lab system and AHS foresight have been instrumental to this success. In January, when it was becoming clear that COVID-19 was coming to Canada, lab leadership and scientists led the development of a standardized approach that all provinces could use to start testing for coronavirus. And quick decision making and standardized protocols, including centralizing testing at two provincial hubs, meant that we uh, are proactively able to source and keep supplies when they are most needed. Supplies will be a critical part of our future success, particularly reagent, which is a 
um, the product of a complex chemical recipe, a uh, key part of being able to actually process the swabs and the tests. Uh, and, and we did have a blip in, in testing a little while back because um, we ran out of reagent. Uh, then we stocked up again, and we are constantly trying to source reagent. In fact, uh, we've gone to the chemical producers in, in Alberta to see if they can help us, at, not just in this province, but, but nationally, uh, to produce more reagent here at home. Um, another point about this, uh, in the last three or four days, people will have noticed that the number of confirmed cases uh, ha have been down pretty significantly. Uh, as, I, as I just reported, uh, we, we have reported um, uh, a relatively small number of uh, 50 new cases over the past uh, 24 hours. That doesn't mean that suddenly the viral sp spread is on a decline in Alberta. As we've tried to explain before, we get day-to-day -day variations in confirmed cases, and they are generally a reflection of how many tests we've done. And uh, since we've been ramping up more and more tests, uh, we got through a backlog, and what we found was that the, the uh, limitations we had placed on who would be prioritized to access tests meant that we had fewer people getting tested than we have capacity to test. And that's why Dr. Hinshaw came forward with an expanded population of people who will be eligible for testing uh, in the weeks to come. Uh, we've, al we've also uh, uh, are working on a strategy. Uh, to continue increasing uh, the number of tests that we do in Alberta. And as I mentioned last night, our, our goal, it's an aspirational goal, but you have to have those. Our reach goal is to get to 20,000 tests per day. Uh, and that will be critical for our relaunch strategy because the more people we can test quickly, and if we can bring on stream uh, what are called serological tests that can indicate whether people have the antibodies, in other words, whether they've been infected and are now, in most cases, presumably immune, that will allow us to clear more people to get back to work while protecting us from a potential second outbreak. All right, let me turn then to uh, the modeling and start by saying uh, that uh, eat, the, the models we have prepared, th these are not infallible. And they are not a crystal ball prediction of the future, but rather they constitute our best effort looking at all of the data, which is constantly changing, to plan for the future. And um, I want to thank uh, the academics, the epidemiologists at the University of Alberta, University of Calgary, for having worked with Alberta Health and AHS uh, on uh, these models. And let me also say that um, we are looking to other jurisdictions and how they are doing modeling. And I think that's happening right across the country. There's a constant comparison of different assumptions, different data sets. Uh, obviously, uh, our team have uh, looked closely at the early tests coming out of uh, Wuhan, for example, for whatever credibility you want to give the, the Chinese reporting. But we have a lot of other data sets now, too, coming from European countries and other provinces. Um, I want to in particular thank um, Bryce Stewart, Assistant Deputy Minister at Alberta Health, who I don't think has slept for the past four days, as he and his, his fantastic team have, have assembled uh, these numbers. Now, as you know, um, uh, finally, let me make this point, that as more data becomes available and other jurisdictions continue to improve their modeling, we see other experiences, we will continue to uh, update our modeling. And you can expect us perhaps on a weekly basis to do that here, uh, certainly on a periodic basis. Um, now, as you know, we have identified two basic models for what might happen in Alberta, the probable scenario and the elevated scenario. We've also come up with, as a kind of thought exercise, an extreme scenario. And I'll explain why we've done that. On the probable scenario, we are assuming that uh, for every a case, there are one or two more people infected that we don't know about. And, and generally, this scenario, this model, closely tracks what we've seen in the United Kingdom, which is uh, a, a relatively uh, success in, in containing the growth, not as successful as Taiwan and Singapore, but we thought it would be prudent uh, to base our model on, on a somewhat similar jurisdiction, uh, and, and that's the United Kingdom. Secondly, uh, the, sorry, the elevated scenario, that assumes uh, for every case that two people are infected. 
And this is comparable to the rate of growth seen in Hubei or Wuhan. Hubei is the province around the city uh, of Wuhan. Um, and we believe it was prudent to identify a steeper slope, a more elevated scenario for planning purposes. Because I, I want to make sure, we all want to make sure that we have sufficient hospital capacity, ventilators, for personal protective equipment, personnel in place, not just for we, what we consider the most likely scenario, but the more aggressive one. And finally, the elevated scenario, you know, this is what would happen if we had not taken any measures. And I think this is very important because as I said last night, there are some folks out there who just say, uh, open, up, open everything up, stop all the social distancing, repeal the public health orders, and let's get back to normal right away. And as I said last night, if we did that, well, I think the consequences would be truly catastrophic in terms of lost life. So here we are. This is uh, the key uh, chart in terms of our models. Um, and what it shows is uh, the, the red line is the extreme scenario. And if we were to hit that extreme uh, model, that would be like right now, this week. So thankfully, we are not there. And we are not there because Albertans have been following uh, the rules around uh, personal distancing and hygiene. The elevated peak is the purple uh, line here, and that would take us to about a million total infections. And as I said last night, from we estimate between 500 and 6,600 deaths. Now, I know that is a, a wide range, but there are so many different factors that go into that. Our job is, well, let me finish, sorry, the black line, of course, is the probable curve. And that pushes the peak out to, us, to, to er, early May, basically the first week of May, whereas the elevated scenario uh, would be a, about two weeks before that. Um, and sorry, the, sorry, the actual probable peak is in mid-May, elevated peak is in early May, just to be clear, and, and about 10 days prior to the uh, probable peak. Probable peak would have uh, 800,000 total infections over this horizon, which goes from mid-March to mid-August. Um, and the extreme uh, peak with no action, the extreme scenario would see, as I said last night, 1.6 million total infections and as many as 32,000 total deaths. Now, uh, after we presented some of this data last night, I saw on Facebook a lot of people said, how could we possibly on the probable scenario, end up with 800,000 infections, which is more than some of these big European countries have experienced with uh, chaos in their hospitals. So please understand that we are using a different baseline. They are talking, when they report those numbers, they are talking about confirmed uh, infections. So those are people who have, either, who have tested positive, many of whom are in the hospitals. What we're talking about here is the total estimated spread through the population. And the vast majority of people who get infected by this virus will experience at worst mild symptoms and many of them will experience no symptoms at all. So folks, when we talk about a total viral spread or of infections of 800,000 over the course of these uh, three months, uh, we are talking about everybody who's in, in, been infected, including people who uh, have not, are not aware of it. Uh, they, they were asymptomatic or they had very mild uh, infections and didn't end up going to the hospital. This is a critical uh, chart because it shows us the capacity of our healthcare system to cope uh, with uh, infections in our probable model. Again, you'll see uh, in this one uh, the um, peak uh, in terms of, of hospitalizations would be in late May. Why is this different? I, I earlier talked about the uh, here, the peak hitting in uh, mid-May. Well, it takes one to two weeks for people who have been infected uh, who manifest serious symptoms to end up in the hospital. So the hospitalization peak is going to be after the peak of infections uh, by 10 days or so. And what this shows is under the probable peak, about 800 people 
uh, being hospitalized. And that's an average in our range. That's the average number. Uh, that's rather the number, uh, uh, that's the probable peak uh, and of hospitalizations. And uh, this is the number would be, that would be in critical care, uh, 232 on average. So in late May, uh, early June, we would need, based on this model, to have at least 230 ICU beds available, and presumably with, with the ventilators available as well. And we would need at least 800 acute care hospital beds available at the same time. This is the um, elevated scenario where, which remember occurs a little bit earlier, the peak of infections occurs earlier, and the peak of hospitalization occurs earlier. In this instance, we would need, if we hit the elevated scenario, we would need about 1,600 acute care beds available um, uh, beginning of May and about 400 uh, ICU beds and ventilators available uh, at the same time. Let me then turn to our measurement of the capacity of the healthcare system. And as I said last night, the, center, the central part of any uh, strategy to cope with COVID is to push down the curve of infections while pulling up the capacity of the healthcare system. Let me begin by describing sort of the steady state of the existing capacity of our health system. Uh, we have over 100 uh, acute care hospitals across the province, which you can see uh, on the map. The 16 largest hospitals are located in Calgary, Edmonton, Red Deer, uh, Grand Prairie, Fort McMurray, Lethbridge, and Medicine Hat. Our total number of adult pediatric and mental health acute care beds is 8,438, and our total number of ICU beds is 324 currently. This, uh, this chart says 295, but we've updated it since then. These numbers are constantly evolving. Um, Along with the 324 intensive care beds, we also have a current inventory of, uh, of 509 ventilators. And let me just say, um, there have been a lot of changes in it, the administration of Alberta health care over the decades. Individual hospital boards, regional boards, provincial board, back to regional, now AHS for the past decade. I think we settled on the right model, which is one single integrated management of the healthcare system, which is helping us to maximize the use of these resources. Meaning that for, in, in those hospitals where we're trying to open up more beds specifically for COVID patients, we've needed to move some acute care patients out. In some cases that meant, has meant going to smaller hospitals, rural hospitals, uh, hospitals in secondary uh, cities. That's a lot easier to do with one single um, provincial administration of healthcare. And I want to commend uh, Dr. Yu and AHS for their uh, alacrity in creating the additional capacity. So on this point, AHS, Alberta Health Services, plans to have 2,250 COVID-19 designated acute care beds by the end of April. Uh, those are beds that have been set aside for the potential peak in hospitalizations. As of April 3rd, last week, uh, just over 1,900 were available for COVID patients, and new uh, beds for COVID patients are being brought online every day. Um, as well, uh, let me just explain how we've, we've created that capacity, partly by postponing uh, scheduled non-essential surgeries. And let me pause there to say, when this is all, when the pandemic is done, there's going to be great pressure on the system to catch up to those uh, delayed surgeries. And we, we regret that, that people have had, in some cases, to live with greater uh, discomfort for a longer period of time. Uh, but we, under, we appreciate their understanding to have rescheduled their surgeries. We've also rescheduled uh, tests and other procedures while ensuring that er, uh, emergency uh, uh, and oncology surgeries continue, of course. We've also transferred uh, to alternative levels of care which means very typically taking somebody who might be in an acute care bed and moving them to home care or a long-term care or supportive living. That's opened up a lot of beds. And we've increased existing infrastructure. So that might mean taking a, a room 
and bringing in two patients and ensuring that they're properly distanced with uh, proper hygiene protocols in place. Finally, I can say that we are planning for an, a, an extreme scenario, one that we do not now expect, but if suddenly we were to see an emergence of a, a huge viral spread here, uh, we do have uh, contingency plans to do what you've seen in, in European cities and to open up space in, um, uh, through, well, for example, there's a, a company down in uh, High River uh, called Sprung Construction that, that has produced uh, uh, temporary uh, hospitals and, and they do this all around the world and we are in advanced conversations with them to provide, for example, that kind of, of, of quick build hospital infrastructure here in Alberta. We've also been in discussions with the Canadian military and other potential backup facilities. Should we need them, we do not think now that we will have to call on that kind of extra capacity. Um, so this kind of puts all of that into numbers. What you see here is uh, that in the probable peak, again, we would require about 800 acute care beds. Uh, and by the end of this month, by the end of April, with all of the efforts that we are making, we expect to see about 2,200, over 2,200 acute care beds available for COVID patients. And two weeks later, we would see uh, just over 800 uh, folks, we estimate, hospitalized. So you can see we have a significant redundancy of available beds for our projected model. Um, if you go up to the elevated scenario, uh, nearly 1,600 beds, again, well below uh, what we hope to achieve through these efforts of 2,250 acute care beds. So to be clear, sufficient beds are currently a, a blocked to manage, and we are continuing to increase the number of beds. Uh, now, this takes us to ICU capacity. Um, a Alberta Health Services plans to be able to increase ICU capacity by nearly 1,100 beds for COVID-19 patients by the end of this month, if necessary. And ICU capacity will be created by adding new beds to existing ICU rooms while ensuring required spacing, converting operating rooms and recovery rooms uh, to ICU capacity and uh, implementing new models of care. Uh, so there are creative solutions that they're pursuing in that regard. Ventilators, as, as people know, a very important piece of equipment because what COVID does is to attack people's lungs and their ability to process oxygen. And so ventilators are, are basically medical equipment that helps people to breathe. And uh, we, uh, currently have, as I've said, 324 uh, ventilators dedicated to COVID-19 patients. In addition to that, there are about 100 people right now in Alberta hospitals using ventilators, and I think uh, about 15 of those are COVID patients. Um, we plan to increase the number of ventilators available for COVID specifically to 761 ventilators by the end of this month, so three weeks from now. Uh, Albert Health Services is also looking at a range of measures to increase capacity, including through uh, purchasing more. So we're aggressively pursuing procurement, both overseas and domestically. Um, as I mentioned, when I launched the uh, Bits and Pieces program last week, uh, the University of Calgary has a team that have been developing a prototype for a ventilator and a manufacturing company here in Edmonton that is ready to start producing those prototypes. We are working with other prospective producers. Um, in British Columbia, Premier Ford in Ontario has been working with manufacturers. And so we are confident that we'll be seeing uh, more ventilators come on market uh, in the weeks and months to come. In addition to that, uh, I want to thank STARS for having lent us uh, six of their ventilators. Uh, Nate and Sate, uh, Northern Alberta Institute and Southern Alberta Institutes of Technology, uh, they both have respiratory therapy programs that train uh, medical techs to operate this equipment, and they're lending us 40. Uh, when I say lending, that we're, I guess it's all being shared within the broader government of Alberta family. We thank their administration for helping with that. 
Um, and I also want to thank the chartered surgical facilities. These are uh, privately operated surgical facilities that do work for the Alberta healthcare system. And they are offering up at least 30 uh, ventilators as well. Uh, finally, we expect to source about 300 from alternative devices capable of mechanical ventilation, including transport, anesthetic, and pediatric devices. Uh, and we may get a handful from the Public Health Agency of Canada. So this gives you a, a visual picture of the ventilator situation. Again, um, on the probable scenario, we'll, we, we estimate we'll need about 230 when we hit the peak of hospitalizations uh, in uh, May, June. And uh, in the, under the elevated model, we'll need just under 400 ventilators. Now here's the key thing, here's where we are now uh, in early April. So you can see um, that, uh, the, the, by the way, the, the dark spots, uh, sorry, this is the, the light blue is the number of ventilators available. Uh, right now, we have significant excess capacity and we are actually expecting that to grow. So we expect to have, we hope to have 760 ventilators available by the end of this month as we head into May and June when we expect the peak of hospitalizations. Uh, and in the, the worst case scenario that we're now planning for, we would have uh, well over 300 uh, ventilators uh, in excess capacity. The real problem becomes actually personnel. Will we have a shortage of personnel who are trained on this uh, equipment? Um, let me say that just on this point, I want to put down a marker here. Because we believe we will have so much excess capacity based on the, our models and our very aggressive procurement efforts, um, we are in contact with other provinces across Canada. You've seen the huge spike in Quebec, uh, as well as, as equipment shortages, supply shortages in, in Ontario. And uh, we are working to identify whether we could uh, lend some of our fellow Canadians some of this critical equipment to help save lives in other parts of Canada, obviously, we would only do so if we are absolutely certain about our ability to maintain access to ventilators and supplies uh, for everybody who becomes sick here in Alberta. But I, I think we're all in this together as Canadians. Workforce is critical. As I said, we can have tens of thousands of ventilators, but if we don't have enough people to operate them, that doesn't get us any further ahead. And the most critical resource in our pandemic response is uh, our healthcare providers. Uh, and several actions have been taken to ensure uh, that the workforce is in place to manage the peak under, bo under both the probable and elevated scenarios. This includes uh, accelerated training for ICU nurses, new models of care to expand the reach of existing ICU nurses, working with the faculties of nursing to complete uh, senior practicums to enable the nurses to enter the workforce, uh, contacting former registered nurses with uh, intensive care experience uh, and other recently retired staff, and I want to thank those who have already come back to work, and a redeployment of certain specialists like anesthesiologists, uh, respiratory therapists, and other allied health professionals uh, where appropriate. So I would like once again to acknowledge uh, the great work of our brilliant frontline healthcare workers, our nurses, doctors, and others in showing flexibility as we have had to manage resources to ensure that uh, we have the people in place to cope with the peak. Um, this then turns to, oh, why, let me just go back to that last chart to say that uh, we, we have a, all share a really serious concern about continuing care facilities or what we used to call nursing homes. And, um, we understand that a number of those facilities are facing acute labor shortages now, partly because we, any folk, anybody who, who might have a cold or a flu that, that would normally work in a nursing home is now self-isolating, partly because we've brought in much more stringent rules around who can work under what conditions. And, uh, you know, for example, if a uh, part-time worker at, at a continuing care facility if that facility has one case of COVID, then 
none of their employees are allowed to work at a, another continuing care facility to prevent spread between facilities. So for a lot of reasons, there are um, growing labor shortages in a number of our uh, seniors' residences and, and, and nursing homes. And uh, so I want to commend uh, Alberta Health for working on, uh, on, on solving that problem, in particular by going to um, some of our colleges like uh, Bow Valley uh, College, for example, in, in Calgary. Uh, they have programs that train uh, folks uh, to work in continuing care facilities, and we're trying to get them placed into the continuing care facilities now on an accelerated basis. And we'll have more to say about that in the days to come. Back to personal protective equipment. So this is our current, a presentation of our current stock uh, and uh, where we see that at the end of April and at the end of June. Uh, it is our estimate of the, uh, I should say our forecast of supplies, the number of days that, that we would have those supplies. So you can see, for example, that um, on N95 masks, under the current probable scenario, at the end of this month, we believe that we would have uh, another month's supply, a, a one-month redundant supply of masks. So we're good. Uh, sorry, on, on uh, N95 masks. On gloves, three months of supply run at the end of April based on the current burn rate. Under the elevated scenario, you can see the numbers. Obviously, we'd be, we would be going through more equipment more quickly. Um, but basically, what you see here is that we definitely have enough equipment uh, to manage uh, for the next month or two. On the right, you see our estimate at the end of June. This would be after the peak. And what you can see here is that we would, be, uh, we would have run low on face shields and potentially on goggles and N95 masks by the end of June. But that does not take into account our very aggressive procurement efforts. And I got to tell you, I mean very aggressive. We, my direction to uh, Alberta Health Services the other day was to go as big as they can. And if we end up with more equipment than we need, then we'll be able to share that with other parts of Canada that are short right now. And we'll be prepared if there is a, a reemergence of the uh, pandemic, for example, in the fall. So uh, to give you an example, toward the end of June, you can see, as I've said, that we would start to get short. But the orders that we've made ensure that we will have sufficient capacity all through the spring and into the summer. For example, Alberta Health Services has ordered in excess of 50 million procedure masks, those are the regular masks, not the N95s, but the regular masks that most healthcare workers use in most circumstances. And those will arrive over the next two months or sooner. And we've also ordered over 250,000 goggles. In order to uh, mitigate risks, we now have cargo charter flights booked with contracts, which will start flying into the Edmonton airport uh, starting Sunday with supplies. Uh, and we're also working constantly to try to uh, lower the burn rate on the equipment. Um, and uh, I think Dr. Yu could say more about that. But we, we do have to keep an eye on that. I, let, let me be blunt. Some folks from different uh, work environments have, have been demanding a, a, a constant supply of the very highest end, end masks, the N95s, for example. Um, <laughs> And the view of health experts is that those masks are necessary and appropriate in certain clinical settings, like when you're dealing with uh, uh, incubate, in, 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 sorry, putting a, somebody on, an, on a ventilator in an intensive care unit, um, but that they are not generally necessary in day-to-day -day functions. And so please understand that, that we are doing our best, and if we are able to get redundant supplies, we will make them more generally available. But we must ensure that there is adequate supply of certain critical protective equipment for our acute care and ICU workers for when we hit the peak. But bottom line here is this. We're doing very well, and I, I want to uh, thank and commend uh, AHS, uh, in particular uh, Jatinder Prasad. What's his, he's the ADM? 
he is the basically the head of procurement at Alberta Health Services. We are, folks, you have no idea how fortunate we are. The hyper competent people in this team, when the, when the, when the uh, story is going to be written about Alberta's response, it, it will come down in part to a lot of remarkably brilliant professionals. Uh, Mr. Prasad and his team at AHS have leveraged the enormous purchasing power of this one unitary uh, health system with a $20 billion budget to develop deep uh, and long-term relationships with major suppliers around the world. And with great wisdom, they planned ahead. They planned ahead and stockpiled enormous uh, quantities of these kinds of materials. Uh, and the relationships they had are now coming through, we, we believe, in a replenishment of supplies. Let me restate what I said about ventilators. We are taking a very close look at, at um, we would like to be able to share at least a portion of redundant uh, stockpiles with other provinces that are running within days short of uh, having no access to some of this critical equipment. Uh, and uh, we'll have more news about that in the days to come. So this comes back to what I was saying about increasing the protective equipment stocks. Uh, we're, as I've said, we're ensuring tight controls over non-health site use. Uh, part of this supply is, uh, part of this, pardon me, is simply education on how to use PPE appropriately. And um, as PPE supplies get tighter globally, there are innovative ideas around uh, reuse, as an example, and uh, sterilizing N95 masks so they could be used multiple times. Um, and as I, I've talked about other opportunities to expand supply, part of that is our bits and pieces program. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, AHS has contracted with local companies to produce face shield and uh, Reflex Manufacturing in Edmonton is contracted to produce scrubs and keep employed over 30 Albertans. So we, we hope that coming out of this, we're all going to have to learn a lesson that we cannot become completely dependent on other countries as a supply source. And uh, we need more domestic production of this kind of equipment. Do you know something? I hope that one good thing that comes out of this whole crisis is a rejuvenation of the Canadian manufacturing sector. And uh, we're seeing that happen as we speak. All right, we're coming close to the end here. So this shows you kind of a sum sums up the key data points. This is a comparison of all scenarios at the estimated peak. Again, the big red bars are the scary extreme scenario. We're not actually there and we're not going to hit it because we have taken rigorous measures in this province to prevent the spread. But um, the dark blue shows you the elevated scenario. Again, about 1,600 hospitalizations at the peak, about 400 ICU beds filled, and uh, estimated uh, 100 deaths at the day of the peak under the elevated scenario. Whereas the probable scenario shows us a little over 18, sorry, a little over 800 hospitalizations at the peak, uh, just over 200 ICU patients at the peak, and approximately 50 fatalities on the day of the peak, uh, which would, in the case of uh, the, this data be late May. And so um, let me then turn to our plan to cope. First of all, uh, we will continue our world-class testing and surveillance. We'll continue aggressive contact tracing and containment, uh, public health interventions, uh, interventions based on evidence of what works. We will support Albertans in pushing the peak down and support fellow Canadians in this time of crisis, as I've said. Then once we get past the peak, we start to move towards relaunch. I spoke about our, the, some key elements of our relaunch strategy last night. They include uh, the continued expansion of testing, moving to mass testing, and hopefully very turn, quick turnaround in that testing, as well as testing people who have uh, uh, been infected and are uh, now hopefully immune so that we can clear more people to go back to work. Secondly, 
increasing all our already strong tracing and tracking tracking pardon me of contacts part of that i i believe will include uh, the use of smartphone apps now when i said this last night it caused some concern amongst people that thought we're going to start the government is going to start tracing where everybody goes all the time that is n ridiculous i was talking about doing this for people who have quarantine orders so let me be clear to protect us from a second phase of the pandemic uh, i believe it, it may be necessary to do what countries like taiwan singapore korea have done and when for example uh, um, somebody arrives from overseas, let's say they come from a, a country with, with a high incidence of, of COVID-19, if we decide to put them under a quarantine order, we want to make sure that they are actually following that quarantine and that they're not going around amongst the general population infecting people. And we should be willing to use modern technology to do that. So this is not a violation of civil liberties. This is an essential and limited public health measure. We'll have more information uh, to follow on that. Uh, also, stronger border screening, as I said last night. I am uh, not impressed with how the federal government managed uh, international arrivals through this whole thing. Uh, we saw Asian countries like Taiwan, Korea, Singapore, Japan, and others it immediately close their borders long before the, w Health, the World Health Organization declared this to be a pandemic uh, in early March. Some of those jurisdictions closed their borders to travelers from Wuhan in mid-January. And uh, in Taiwan, they have fewer confirmed cases of infection than Canada. Their schools and businesses have continued to function. They're being extremely vigilant. And, 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 and so I, I just think we need to learn from that. And that is why uh, we are developing a plan to deploy teams uh, from the Alberta government uh, to port ports of entry to do rigorous screening and ensure proper application of quarantine rules for international arrivals. I see my friend Premier Horgan in British Columbia has just announced effectively a very similar policy. But we appreciate our partnership with the federal government in many aspects of the COVID crisis. Uh, but on this, if they won't do the job at the ports of entry, uh, at least this provincial government will. And, and finally, um, Further to Dr. Hinshaw's uh, revised advice about uh, the appropriate use of masks in public, uh, we intend to encourage and facilitate a broader use of uh, face coverings uh, to help limit the spread, uh, particularly when people go into crowded situations. So when we get back to relaunch, you know, we're going to encourage people, if they're getting on a subway or a bus, for example, or they're going into a crowded shopping mall, uh, to uh, engage in the appropriate use of a face mask. Those are some of the policies. One other that I mentioned in the legislature um, this afternoon is that uh, we intend to take a regional approach to the relaunch. So if we have some regions where there has been little or no cases uh, and very little viral spread, uh, we, we will very likely relax some of the public health orders in those regions before they are relaxed for certain areas where there's been a much higher incidence of viral infection. That's some of the emerging advice that we're getting across the world to help to uh, accelerate relaunch. That's the presentation. Uh, before we take questions, uh, sorry, I do have presentations, doctor. I'm sorry, I took so much time, I apologize. We're now going to hear um, from Dr. Hinshaw, Dr. Hinshaw and then uh, Dr. Yu. And I want to thank both of them for the remarkable uh, professionalism and leadership through all of this. Thank you, Premier, and uh, thank you for coming. So uh, Premier has gone over in great detail the modeling. I won't restate the, uh, the points that he made. I would just want to highlight a couple of key things with modeling. Uh, as Premier said, modeling is an estimate based on the best known data at the time that the model is put together but we will continue to adjust it based on emerging Alberta data and evidence. And so you will, as was said, see this model evolving over time. But the most important factor in how big or small the impact of COVID-19 is in this province is the behavior of each and every one of us. This cannot be stressed enough. 
If Albertans stop following public health restrictions and guidelines, we can expect to experience a higher impact than the data currently suggests. If Albertans strictly follow all public health guidance, we collectively can further reduce the impact from what the modelling is currently predicting. To the people who might look at the scenarios presented today and think, well, those aren't that bad, I want you to remember that every person who is in hospital, every person who passes away, is beloved by family and friends and is a loss. This is not the time to relax our approach. To those who look at the numbers and think they are frighteningly high, I say to you, we can change the outcome. Remember that the modelling is giving us the total number of anticipated infections in the whole population, not just the confirmed cases. That makes the numbers higher than what we have seen in other countries who are reporting their confirmed cases. It is also based on an assumption that every COVID case spreads infection to one or two other people. We can collectively reduce that. Changing our total infections in the province is in our hands. Every action makes a difference. Data makes a difference as well. And with that in mind, although none of us need a lab test to do the right thing, we are making some additional changes to our testing criteria to ensure that we have as much information as possible to understand how our outbreak is unfolding. Even with the recent addition to our testing eligibility to include seniors 65 years of age and older with symptoms, our daily testing numbers are still lower and our than our labs have the capacity to test. Therefore, we are looking at our data to determine where to strategically use testing capacity. We know that Calgary has had a higher percent positive rate in their lab testing, and this has persisted even with the change in our testing this last week. In order to get as much information as possible to reduce spread in that area, we are expanding testing effective immediately to include all residents of the Calgary zone who have a cough, fever, runny nose, sore throat, or shortness of breath. We are also opening testing to essential service workers across the province with any of the same symptoms I just mentioned, and we are defining that as anyone whose work site has not been closed to public access by public health orders, and who, if they were well, would currently be working outside the home. I want to emphasize we continue to expect anyone who is ill to remain home for at least 10 days from the start of their symptoms or until symptoms resolve, whichever is longer. Finally, anyone who has any of these same symptoms, again, runny nose, sore throat, shortness of breath, fever or cough, and who lives with a person who is 65 years of age or older is also eligible for testing. Anyone in any of these categories should use the online Alberta Health Services assessment tool as the way to access testing. Going through the online tool will be the pathway to booking a test and a new process is now in place. That means anyone who goes through that online assessment does not need to also call 811. One of these assessment tools is for the general public, including those over 65 and those who live with anyone over 65. Another tool is for workers on the list of those eligible. Please use this online tool for testing. Again, this is anyone who has symptoms who fall into one of these categories. While increasing testing is an important step to help identify people with COVID-19 in order to do contact tracing and prevent spread, I want to reiterate that the best way to contain this outbreak is by all of us staying home as much as possible and thereby limiting our chances of catching the virus. Also, please remember, as I said, anyone with any of these five symptoms should stay home and away from others for 10 days after the start of symptoms or until symptoms resolve, whichever is longer, even without a lab test. This is critical. To all Albertans, please stay home as much as possible. Even on this upcoming holiday weekend, continue to use virtual means to connect socially. This is the most important step you can take to help prevent spread of the virus. If you do need to go out, practice physical distancing and proper hygiene. I know people are anxious to resume their normal lives. My family is too. However, like I've said before, this is our new normal for right now. 
data helped inform the implementation of public health measures, and the measures will only be eased once the data tells us it is safe to do so. I know many people may be wondering if further public health measures will be put into place as we near the virus's peak. This is not a question I can answer at this time. I will continue to monitor the data and will make recommendations based on what that data is saying. What I can tell you is that the coming days and weeks will be critical. The cooperation of all Albertans is needed. Each and every one of us must continue to do everything we can to prevent the spread of this virus. This is in our hands and we can do this together. I'll now pass it over to Dr. Yu. Thank you, Premier and Dina, and good afternoon to everyone. I'm pleased that we're having this opportunity to share our COVID-19 modeling with all Albertans today. It's important that you have this information because we are in this together and we will overcome this together. However, to do so, we all must have an understanding of the scope and complexity of the challenge ahead of us and what each of us needs to do to keep ourselves and our loved ones safe we must all pull together in the same direction. I'd like to thank the data and analytics teams with the Government of Alberta and Alberta Health Services for building these models based on the most current data from Alberta and around the world. We know the models we've shared with you today don't tell us exactly what's gonna be happening months ahead, but they do help us and help the government plan, a, uh, plan for a surge in demand for healthcare. As Premier has indicated, these projections might unsettle some Albertans, and I understand that. This is not a situation that many Albertans have experienced in their lifetimes. But please know that these models and these numbers are helping us plan, prepare, and do our very best to make sure that Albertans who need hospital care, whether it's related to COVID or not, can get that care in the weeks and months ahead. Guided by these models, AHS is now adding thousands of new hospital beds to the system, including additional intensive care spaces. We're bringing in more ventilators through our supply chain and bringing older models out of storage, and we're training additional clinical staff in order to operate them. We're procuring more protective personal equipment for frontline healthcare providers at AHS and across the province at continuing care sites, physician offices, and centers set up for the homeless population. We're working with staff and physicians to ensure that they feel protected with the PPE that they have and also that we have the supplies to last for the duration of the crisis. Our procurement team at AHS has been sourcing additional PPE across the world to ensure that we have adequate supply now and into the future because we need to protect our healthcare workers. They are our heroes. They are Alberta's heroes. I'd like to thank all of our frontline workers, as well as those who support them for their dedication to their life-saving work in a time of crisis and for the care and compassion they're sharing with Albertans. I'm so proud and appreciative of our staff and physicians, and I know that Albertans are too. I just ask Albertans to help our frontline staff by washing your hands regularly, not touching your face with unwashed hands, disinfecting regularly touched surfaces, self-isolating if you feel sick, staying home as much as you can, and when you must be in public, practicing physical distancing, keeping at least two meters away from others. We know how COVID-19 is transmitted, and we know what we need to do to protect ourselves and our loved ones. That brings me a degree of reassurance during this time. There are many things that are within our control that will help us and protect us during this global pandemic. Focusing on what we control has served us well so far. Alberta responded early and aggressively to the threat posed by this pandemic. And because of that, our province has fared better than many jurisdictions. And yet my heart aches knowing that Albertans have lost loved ones to this virus. And sadly, our families and communities will experience more loss in the weeks ahead. And my heart goes out to them. And we can honor the Albertans that we have lost by maintaining our focus on what we can control and our diligence to physical distancing and self-oscillation. That will save lives. That's what we need to do, and we can only do it together. Thank you. 
Okay, we'll start the Q&A. Uh, we'll start in the room. Go ahead, Dean. Question for Dr. Hinshaw, please. I had time to write this down, actually. <laughs> so with the caveat that uh, the data changes and modeling changes, uh, um, but now that we have this modeling, I'm wondering, can you give Albertan some insight into how you plan to apply uh, this data, uh, the guidelines that you use? And I'll give you a, a, an example of what I'm driving at. So for example, the data shows under the probable scenario that uh, if uh, the hospitalizations will peak uh, in, what is it now, late, um, late May, right? Mid-May. Mid Mid -May. Yeah, so so if, if you believe that we can start perhaps allowing large gatherings shortly after that peak, then Albertans can sort of expect the large gatherings to, to, to be allowed a few weeks after that. However, if you believe that we need to see a steep drop in the hospitalizations before you would consider large gatherings, then that means Albertans under the current stats would probably have to wait till Canada Day. So I think I'm just trying to get some insight into what, what is guiding you on these decisions and what can you share with Albertans on that? So I would say that it's a little early. This modeling, again, is, is the first cut at a prediction. Um, and I think over the next one to two weeks, we'll have a better sense as we expand our testing, we get more data, what our curve is actually looking like. And again, as I mentioned, this model is based on an assumption that every person who has COVID will spread it to one or two other people and it will continue to spread. If we do a better job than that, then we don't have to see that peak that's in the model. And so I really hesitate at this point in time to give a prediction about, uh, will it be June? Will it be the end of May? Will it be July? Partly because I think that we're so early in this. I know it doesn't feel like that for people for your who- your underlying been... philosophy going. <laughs> okay, right. my underlying philosophy is we have to see at least two to three weeks of cases starting to drop because that will tell us, because every case we're seeing now has been exposed in the previous two weeks. And so we have to see two to three weeks of case counts going down before we'll have a really solid sense that we actually have turned that corner and we can consider, again, it likely won't be opening everything up all at the same time, but there may be certain uh, pieces that we can turn back on, so to speak, and then continue to watch the data. But as was mentioned, uh, what our ability to do that is supported uh, as we're able to increase our testing, our contact tracing, so that we're making sure that we're not just opening it up and hoping for the best, but we're continuing that aggressive focus on confirmed case isolation and contact isolation as well. But that's my philosophy would be, we have to see at least two to three weeks of case decline to really be confident. Not hospitalization, case decline. Well, hospitalizations will be our most stable number because our cases entirely depend on who we're testing. And so when I say case decline, I'm talking about the whole picture, looking at ICU hospitalizations and our overall cases as a function of who we're testing. Uh, but right now, uh, the, the choice of who we test won't change our hospitalization numbers. So that is the most stable and uh, solid number that won't be uh, fluctuating based on who we're choosing to test. Okay, hey, we'll jump to the phone. Operator, can you put through the first caller, please? First question is from Rick Bell of the Calgary Sun. Please go ahead. Uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, this question is for Premier Kenny. Uh, Premier, what do you say to those people who are behaving, they're following the rules, they're listening to you and to Dr. Hinshaw and to other people in the healthcare community, they're doing the right thing, they're still committed to doing the right thing, and they even might be a little bit encouraged by some of the modeling where you've shown the availability of beds and of supplies and of ventilators, but it's starting to wear them down. Um, the news of the economy, perhaps the news of friends who've lost their jobs or news of people who've been sick or just the constant headlines, the constant stories, the constant coverage, wall-to-wall, 24-7 uh, of the virus and of the disease. What can you say to them? How can you speak to them, to those people? These aren't the people in crowds. These aren't the people driving to the provincial parks. These are people doing the right thing. But they're just feeling a little bit beleaguered by all the information, all the apocalyptic headlines, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What, what can you say to them? You've given them some encouraging news today with some of the modeling, but what could you say to them if you could speak to them directly one-on-one? -on -one. First of all, I would say get ready for tomorrow. The unemployment stats 
for March will be released tomorrow, and they're going to be really bad. I would not be surprised if it's the worst jobs numbers that we have seen uh, in 80 years. This is why last night I said I'm not going to sugarcoat any of this. We've got to treat everybody as grown-ups. They've got to know what's coming at us. We're trying to prevent, present the most realistic numbers we can on the pandemic and a real sense of where the economy is going. What I would say to them is, folks, uh, keep calm and carry on. Follow the rules, stay safe, but don't let this drag you down. <laughs> you know, Rick, let's put this in context. People went through 10 years of the Great Depression. Our economy shrank by half. Tens of thousands of people lost their farms and their homes. The, the, the Great War, the Second War, five years in each case of people every morning wondering if a telegram was going to sh show up at home about a relative who died on the battlefield, checking the newspapers to see if their neighbors were affected every day for five years. So let's just put this in perspective. Compared to those times of real uh, desperation, we're in a much, much better place. What we're saying here today is we believe we're going to be out of this uh, this spring or in the summer. We'll stay vigilant to make sure that we don't get uh, hit by uh, a second wave. Um, and yeah, we're going to be in some tough economic times, I would estimate, for at least 18 months. But we will get out of that. We're so much better prepared than we have been at, at similar times of real trial in the past. We're so much wealthier. We have the miracle of modern science and technology. We have uh, so much going for us. So uh, I get it. People are feeling beleaguered. They're feeling a bit stir crazy, locked up at home. Uh, and they're going to get more frustrated over the course of the next few weeks. Uh, that applies to everybody. Rick, we're going to be coming forward with uh, some additional support uh, for mental health, because I think people are going to need it. So in the next little while, we'll be coming forward with a, with a big mental health package to help people who, whose mental health is being really affected by all of this. I guess finally I would say, um, find joy in small things. For seniors who are locked in, I, I hope they can, by phone or Skype, reach out and see their grandkids every day. This is why we've got to reach out to the people who are isolated. You know, we can all make it better for each other just by being a little bit nicer to our friends uh, and neighbors and, and family. And as I said last night, oh, uh, we're all in it together. All right, go ahead, Kieran. Question for Premier as well. Um, I just want to clarify some of the cell phone stuff, and I have a lot of questions, so maybe I'll just take what I thought you said and you can just clarify if I'm wrong. What I heard you kind of bring up was that you're going to dispatch teams from the government to go to places like airports where there are border points and people coming from specific destinations. You're going to force them to put apps on their phones because that's what you would have to do. You'd have to take their phone and put an app on it that would let the government of Alberta, if, if the government determines that they need to be quarantined, track their movement and you would do this for specific individuals for certain countries and I'm if that's the case I'm just wondering how long would that go on for you know is this till the end of the summer till the end of the pandemic and some more details around that well the details will come when we announce the policy we're not there yet I'm uh, letting people know about one of the tools that we could use uh, and here's the point in in the countries that have been most successful at protecting lives without slamming their economies. Countries like Singapore, jurisdictions like Hong Kong, Taiwan, and South Korea. They have all used modern technology to limit the spread. And one way they've done it in those cases, in those countries, if somebody came in from an area with a high level of infections, uh, they would put certain restrictions on them. 
In some cases, that might be mandatory quarantine. You go straight into a quarantine center. In other cases, it might be check in once a day, check your um, temperature with, a, with an app, and we're going to know if you're circulating in the general population or not. So here's my point. We're going to have a choice to make. We get past the peak. We can either maintain super tight lockdown on our economy for months to come, in which case the economic damage would be incalculable, or we can take a more targeted approach like those countries have done so smartly by limiting the risk, focusing on, um, on for example, on, on stronger border screening uh, for incoming arrivals. Look, I went to the Edmonton airport, I think uh, a few days after WHO declared a global pandemic, and there were people lined up t close to one another in a queue, uh, touching the same uh, uh, CBSA uh, screens with no sanitation, where there was, they, they were, weren't even being told about our advice to self-isolate for 14 days. There was no relevant public health information going on. There was no hand sanitizer available. There were no masks made available for people with symptoms. As far as I could see, there were no masks for CBSA people who were staffing it. There was no visible presence of public health officials. There was no uh, requirement that people who were sick go into quarantine. The first case in Canada came to Vancouver from China. The first case in Toronto came from Iran, countries that were facing elevated levels of viral spread. I think it was irresponsible to let it happen that way. And I join NDP Premier John Horgan in saying, if the, federal, if the federal government will not properly protect our borders, we will. We are confident that we have the authority to do so under the Public Health Act. It allows the Minister of Health to authorize the admission into any place for any purpose, for, pub for public health purposes. Uh, and that includes, as far as I'm concerned, the international arrival areas of our airports. So. The exact uh, parameters around the potential use of smartphone apps uh, will will be developing that policy. It will be answering all of your questions, which are legitimate. Um, what I'm saying is we ha will have to make choices in this new world. One choice is either we lock everybody down on a kind of quasi permanent basis, which is impossible. Or we take a smarter, more targeted approach and one way of doing that is the smart use of, 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 uh, of uh, wireless technology. All right, we'll go back to the phone operator. Can you put through the next caller, please? Yes, the next call is from Emma Graney of the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. G'day, guys. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, so I have one for Dr. Hinshaw here and then a really quick follow-up for um, Premier Kenny. Um, uh, just basically around these numbers, how should Albertans like interpret these numbers, especially when you've got such wide, like wide ranges here? We've got 400 deaths at the best case, um, 6,600 is the most pessimistic scenario. So, what's the takeaway for the public when things feel so uncertain? And just briefly to the Premier, I'm curious as to why you presented these numbers rather than Dr. Hinshaw. So with respect to the numbers, I would say again that this is uh, an early model and there's a lot of uncertainty given that the, especially in the deaths data, it really depends what age groups get infected. So the models that we've run, um, if you input different parameters with respect to assumptions about whether age groups are infected uh, at the same rate or whether some age groups are infected more than others, uh, then clearly from what we've seen both in Alberta and other places, if more of our cases are in the over 80 age group or even the over 65 age group, uh, we will see more deaths and that can vary so widely. So again, some of those wide variations in numbers are really because, again, it all depends on us. So it depends how successful we are in preventing spread, particularly how successful we are in protecting those who are the most vulnerable to severe outcomes. And so I think to Albertans, I would say again, that this is in our hands. 
uh, that we can make a difference, not just in the deaths numbers, but we can make a difference in the overall numbers and the shape of the curve. And as we continue to see new cases, new hospitalizations, that data will help us in the coming weeks to uh, involve that information in new modeling uh, that can be more accurate and more precise. And so that's the kind of thing that I think Albertans can look forward to is understanding how does what we're actually seeing in our real numbers that are reported, how does that relate to the modeling and how will it inform it going forward? But again, I would just leave, uh, leave you with this final um, assurance that again, this, it's up to us and we can make a difference and make things come down to that lower end rather than the upper end. Uh, and so I really want to emphasize that these numbers are not set in stone. And uh, Emma, I presented the information because I'm the Premier and therefore ultimately responsible for the Government of Alberta's response uh, to this public health emergency. It's a whole of government response. We are very fortunate to have, I think, the best Chief Medical Officer in Canada in Dr. Hinshaw, and uh, who provides us with great advice uh, that we follow and it's advice based on data. Uh, however, the response is broader than simply um, the public health aspect narrowly construed. It involves a procurement of equipment, it involves obviously fiscal policy, it involves uh, statutory amendments, it involves uh, a whole range of things uh, that require intergovernmental coordination. Um, I can tell you that I chair the Emergency Management Committee of Cabinet and in a typical day we are discussing 8 to 11 uh, major agenda items, perhaps two or three of which involve uh, narrowly the public health aspect. But uh, this is much broader. And just as uh, pre other premiers across Canada and governors across the United States have prevented, presented a similar data for their jurisdictions, uh, it's only natural that we should follow the same uh, pattern uh, here in Alberta, where uh, the head of government is ultimately responsible uh, for the coordinated response. All right, back to the floor, Lisa. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, this is for Dr. Yu. Um, I'm wondering, because we've been hearing kind of conflicting things from people, I'm wondering if you can clarify, you spoke about personal protective equipment today. Um, are healthcare workers limiting their use in some circumstances? And what circumstances would those be? Um, basically, are they needing to cut corners and ration and why would they be doing that in what specific right. circumstances? We actually are just putting out some guidelines for today uh, for all our healthcare workers around appropriate usage of PPE. And as you have heard from Dean in the past, some of the evidence is changing uh, almost day by day. So we are trying to have to adapt to the newest evidence. Uh, but we are definitely very aligned with PHAC and WHO around the recommendations. Um, I would say that uh, PPE, as the Premier has highlighted, is about supply and demand. And although we think that we are well prepared in terms of supply, we need to be cognizant that we also need to be stringent with the demand piece. And as the Premier had mentioned around reusage, uh, that is one of the things that we're looking uh, for, especially for some of the more difficult to, I think, uh, acquire supplies like N95 masks. And there's been some good recommendations coming out of PHAC around reuse uh, and sterilization of those masks. And sorry, if follow up, what, when can we expect those guidelines again? Yeah, it's coming out today, so we can provide that to you. All right, we'll go back to the phone operator. Can you put through the next caller, please? Yes, the next question is from Terry Reith of CBC. Please go ahead. Yes, hi, thank you. My question is for the Premier. As part of the relaunch strategy, you uh, state as a, an aspirational goal 20,000 tests per day. Uh, in the technical briefing, they mentioned that about 2,000 of those would be serological tests, which require blood draws. Uh, that is a lot of tests. i uh, wondering if you could just talk to us about the logistics of doing that many tests. What would that look like? Would this be drive-throughs, special clinics? How can you do that many tests in a day? Uh, and and what do you mean by precise tracking of these cases? Well, we've received a briefing uh, at the Emergency Management Committee of Cabinet uh, from uh, AHS uh, earlier this week about an expanded testing regime. And uh, we won't be able to get to a number like that overnight, but we'll, we hope to build up to it gradually. It's dependent on the availability of supplies like reagents. Uh, we, uh, there are labs that are not currently in use, uh, for example, a Dynalife that are pending approval 
uh, to perform the COVID-19 testing. Uh, that would significantly expand our uh, testing capacity. Um, and I think the part of the answer to your question is all of the above. Um, we already do have an unlimited basis drive-through testing available. Um, we are expanding the population of people who are eligible for testing. We did that earlier this week. As the uh, number of tests increase, the, our capacity increases, we will also expand the population of people who are eligible for testing. Um, as you know, there are a, a number of uh, serological tests that are, uh, have either been approved in some jurisdictions or are pending approval, and we're uh, closely tracking that. Uh, we would like to uh, bring on, make serological testing part of our testing strategy, in part so that we can look at, at uh, not just uh, people who are infected, but also people who have been infected and have the antibodies. Uh, that's what a number of other jurisdictions have done as well. Uh, I, I would invite, is maybe Dr. Yu, would you like to compliment that? I think the Premier's point about being aspirational is a really good one, and we are very proud of our lab team, but as you know, it's not just about the diagnostic testing and the reagents, which are sometimes very difficult to achieve, but as you noted, the assessment centers that we've opened up, and in fact, you know, the ability to expand those obviously is something that we would need to do if we were to go up to 20,000. The other thing that we have been working on is actually trying to decentralize some of the testing so that it's not only in Edmonton and Calgary, and that uh, there are some plans to actually extend it to some of the other major regional centers in Alberta. All right, back to the floor. Go ahead, Julia. Hi, this question is for Dr. Yu. Um, just on the note of repurposing or reusing equipment, just hoping for a few more details about how that's going to be happening. Mm -hmm. Will it be happening within each facility or do, does the equipment need to be taken somewhere else? Yeah. Um, how quickly can that be turned around and when will that be starting? Yeah, so you're asking a lot of questions on that one, but let me try to see what I can do with that. So um, what we've done is that we've actually done some initial testing that shows that we can actually do steam sterilization of N95 masks. And when we initially presented that information back to EMCC and the Premier, we actually thought that we could probably reuse each N95 mask about three times, and we actually think it could be even more than that. Uh, we're actually working also with the University of Calgary and Dr. John Conley to actually um, uh, do a research uh, to actually make sure that, in fact, when we actually do sterilize the masks, that uh, the research shows that, in fact, there is no further COVID contamination on the masks. Uh, in terms of the details about how long it takes and the processing, um, that's still TBD, I would say. Uh, we're sort of trying to now set up, I would say, sort of almost recycling uh, bins. Uh, we're starting off in Calgary as a start, and the intention is to actually extend that to especially this, the top 16 sites. Okay, we'll head back to the phone. Operator, can you put through the next caller, please? Yes, the next question is from Kelly Kreiderman of the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Hi there. Good evening, everyone. Um, I just wanted to ask why the projections for the number of cases and potential death rate are around 1% when we are hearing in general about a 3 to 5% fatality rate for COVID. I'm also wondering from the Premier whether his focus on a recovery strategy needs to be replicated by other provinces in order to be effective and why Alberta is moving forward with kind of strict measures to restart the economy when other provinces don't seem to be talking about this very much to now. So I'll take the first question with respect to why the percentages in the models are lower. I'll just reiterate that the total number of cases presented in the models reflects what we anticipate would be the entire number of infections in the population. And what we're seeing in terms of the reported numbers from other jurisdictions, even our own reported numbers, that is not all infections in the population. Uh, so especially as jurisdictions like Italy or Spain or some places in the United States, as they have an increased number of cases, they're testing mostly those who have more severe illness uh, because their testing capacity it doesn't necessarily extend to uh, a broader group of people as the epidemic progresses. And so it really depends, again, when you're looking at those reported numbers, you're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. So a, a, a higher percentage of that tip of the iceberg will be severe or end up in death. 
But if you're counting as the models do, you're, you're anticipating that total number of infections, the percentage that have a severe outcome or die will be much smaller again, just because you have that bigger denominator that's even bigger than those confirmed cases. And I'll uh, turn it over to Premier for a second. The reason I began to present the outlines of our relaunch strategy last night is because Albertans need to see that there is a way forward and we need to begin planning for that. As I said, uh, the economic shutdown is also having an impact on people's health and well-being. We can't ignore that. And so if we can develop more focused tools uh, that uh, will allow us to relax public health orders and social distancing measures while helping uh, to protect us from a potential second wave of the pandemic, that's what we mu must do. There's a lot of literature being produced right now by uh, academics, think tanks and others about the best strategies for relaunch. We want to get to relaunch as soon as we can. We don't want to improvise our way to that. And so that's why we're already developing uh, policy tools now that will help us to accelerate uh, 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 relaxing a number of these uh, um, met, uh, public health orders that we've had to put in place that have had a re very real human impact. You know, as, as I follow this, I see kind of two extremes in the debate. One, I responded to last night, says that this is all overblown. Uh, let the virus run its course, open everything back up now because the economic and social damage is too great. The other is let's absolutely shut everything down now and as long as it takes until we go to zero risk on the virus. I think what we're taking is a responsible, prudent middle course based on the data and the best public health advice. But as I said last night, we cannot focus exclusively on the uh, COVID-19 or on the economy. The two are intertwined. And I think that is, is reflected in our effort to develop uh, a, a, a relaunch strategy as soon as possible. I would hope and expect other provinces are looking at doing that as well. And um, I think it's especially necessary here in Alberta, given the triple threat that we face, the third element of which is the collapse in our uh, energy economy. Back to the floor, go ahead. Yeah, my question is for Dr. Hinshaw about uh, this a potential second wave that the Premier just talked about. And I know it's early and I know you say that is the severity of, of our impacts on this is up to us. Um, but is, it, is there really just a potential for a second wave or is it just about softening the blow of an inevitable second wave? So what we've seen with other new viruses. So if we think about 2009, which wasn't that long ago, uh, we had a, a wave in the spring and we had another wave in the fall. And the wave in the fall was bigger than the one in the spring. However, our response to the pandemic in 2009 was nowhere near what we've done for this particular uh, virus. And that's appropriate because it did not cause the same kinds of severe outcomes that we're seeing with COVID. So what I would say is that if what we did was stopped all of our public health measures, let go of all of our testing and control measures, we probably would see a second wave. But I think that the path that's being articulated is to say our public health measures are buying us time to build up our testing capacity, to get closer to having effective treatments that are proven by research. Uh, we won't have a vaccine by the fall, but the longer we can uh, keep the spread in our population from growing the closer we get to some of those therapies that that we see down the road. And so the plan would be to uh, have that aggressive testing, contact tracing, uh, some of the measures that have been discussed, such as uh, considering the use of masks in public, regular hand hygiene, a lot of those preventive measures, even trying to stay two meters apart when out in public, some of those things may continue even after we lift some of the business restrictions and the other societal restrictions that we have in place right now. So it will be a balance in order to prevent that second wave. I don't think we can go back entirely to the way things were three months ago, uh, but neither do we need to stay fully locked down for months on end to prevent that second wave. All right, we'll take one more from the phone and then we have to wrap up. Operator, can you put through the last caller, please? 
Yes, the next question is from Stephanie Rousseau of Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Hi there. My first question is for Dr. Inch. I was wondering if uh, you can just provide an update on the Manuel du Lac in McLennan. Uh, has there been more deaths over there? And uh, do you know how many cases there are? And then for uh, Monsieur Kenny, je me demandais juste est-ce que vous pouvez nous dire, vous avez parlé d'envoyer des équipements de l'Alberta vers euh, peut-être le Québec ou l'Ontario. Euh, je me demandais si vous pouvez nous donner un petit peu plus de détails de quel type d'équipement euh, serait, serait envoyé, est-ce que vous avez des discussions à ce sujet-là avec ces provinces-là? Et sur la question de la surveillance aussi, euh, est-ce que vous pouvez nous dire un peu pourquoi vous voulez faire ça et est-ce que vous ne pensez pas que ça peut être dangereux? So thank you uh, for your first question. Uh, unfortunately, there are now 16 confirmed cases in the Manoir du Lac um, retirement home uh, and two deaths. So uh, yes, unfortunately, there, there has been a progression of cases in that facility. And again, local public health is working very closely with them uh, to do everything possible to prevent further spread. Comme j'ai dit, nous croyons que nous avons sur plus actuellement d'équipements importants pour combattre le coronavirus. C'est la raison pour laquelle nous sommes en contact avec les autres gouvernements provinciaux pour voir leurs besoins. Je, je ferai une annonce dans les jours à venir, mais je crois qu'on peut partager une certaine quantité de nos de nos euh, biens ici, euh, de, par exemple, l'équipement de protection personnelle, euh, peut-être euh, euh, l'autre équipement euh, aux autres pro provinces. Euh, je vois que le Québec en particulier euh, fait face à un défi énorme avec le taux euh, des infections le plus élevé au Canada. Et l'Ontario également, ils ont une pénurie euh, des... Euh, des choses pour, pour combattre le, le, le COVID-19. Alors, on, nous n'avons pas pris les décisions finales, mais nous sommes ouverts en principe à partager une, cer une certaine euh, quantité euh, de, de nos ressources aux autres provinces euh, si nous sommes certains que nous aurons assez d'équipements pour euh, donner le soin aux Albertains. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.